Well, good morning. Welcome to each and every one of you. It's great to see all of you. A very special welcome to any guests that we have with us today. We're so glad that you're here. We warmly welcome you as well. And what an opportunity uh, together to praise our God, to lift those songs of praises together. And as we enter into this time of worship, I want to read just a couple of verses from Psalm 135. L listen closely. The psalmist declares... Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord. We are here together this morning to offer our praise to God, to give Him the praise of our lips, to offer to Him the praise of our lives as well. And we're going to do that right off the bat. We're going to sing together. Let's stand. We praise you, O God. Congregation, our good and gracious God greets each one of us this morning with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue to lift our voices in praise to our God together. We know this one. Let's sing it out. Oh, praise the name.
Would you pray with me a moment? Lord God, it is so good to be in your house today, to be here to worship you, to glorify you, to praise your holy name, because yours is the name that is above every other name. You are the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the undisputed King of this universe and the master of our lives. We are so grateful to gather here today. And Father, we pray that as we worship you this morning that you would move by your Spirit in this place and in the hearts of your people. God, that you would make us ready not just to praise you in this place, but to go from this place singing your praises as well. And singing those praises not only with our lips, but certainly with our lives. So we give you this time and we thank you for it. We give you our very selves. And Father, would this time be a, a blessing to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, as we think about God's will for our lives this morning, I'd like to share with us a reading from the book of James uh, in the New Testament, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And I'd like for us to listen really closely with, uh, to this today. Uh, we're going to be uh, thinking a lot today, as you uh, no doubt already uh, saw in that order of worship, our topic today is going to be uh, kindness. We're going to think about the fact that love is a kind. That's obviously an action word, and we'll talk more about that. But as we even begin thinking about that, to let these words infiltrate uh, our hearts today, James 2, 14 through 26, God's will for his people. James writes, is carried along by the Holy Spirit, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now we hear that, some of us, and uh, those of us who struggle sometimes with the book of James are in good company. That, of course, would be Martin Luther. Martin Luther struggled with the book of James because it's, he saw it as contradictory to what the Apostle Paul was writing, for instance, about being saved by grace alone through faith alone. And James says, wait, it's, it's faith and works. But what James is talking about here is a living faith. What James is talking about is having a faith that has both belief and behavior, that those two necessarily go together. And Jesus, for instance, talked about that in a variety of places. One of those places is Matthew 12, verse 33, where Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. So really what James is saying is inescapable, that belief and behavior necessarily go hand in hand. He sums it up for us again in the last verse, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. God's will for his people, that we put our faith into action, that you and I, we have a living faith. That's what God wants from us. 
right? A faith not just in our head and our heart, but a faith that also is by way of our hands. God's will for his people today. So we go to God in a time of prayer. I want to highlight just a couple of things for us today. First thing is something that I neglected to mention last Sunday, and I want to make sure that uh, I bring it to light so that we know about it and pray about it. It was in the announcement sheet last week, but it has to do with Hannah Ritzma. Uh, Hannah has uh, left for basic training with the Air Force to San Antonio, uh, so pray for her over the next several weeks uh, of that basic training and a, a new step, uh, certainly uh, in her life. Then also want to highlight an announcement in today's uh, announcement sheet has to do with uh, a member of our congregation having a very special birthday, and that is Alice Denbeston, and she's going to be turning 105 on Thursday. Is that amazing or what? 105. I think at the very least that deserves a round of applause. You know, I very much considered having us sing happy birthday, but I, I'm not sure that, uh, that Alice watches or, or listens to the service, but uh, if you get a chance, uh, send a card uh, to her. Her address is there in the announcement sheet. She loves getting cards, so um, send her a card, say happy birthday. Uh, she'd really much appreciate that. So let's go to God together in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning certainly with praise uh, being the number one reason that we are here. We praise you, God, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. And we do lift up your name and exalt you as the king of this universe. God, it is good and right and fitting for us to gather together like this. And we're so very thankful for the opportunity, especially in the, the atmosphere of today's world. But to gather together, to praise you, to, to lift up your name, to exalt you, to magnify, to, to extend our gratitude to you from the bottom of our hearts for who you are and for all you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for this time. Father, we thank you for the salvation that you have given to us in Jesus. And we recognize again this morning that that was purely by grace. Nothing we did to deserve it. Certainly nothing we could ever do to earn it in any way whatsoever. But you saw our helpless state. And you gave us your Son to be our Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. And we are eternally grateful for that. And Father, we've just turned our attention to your word and and we wanted to be reminded once again as how it is you want us to live as your people. And we hear very clearly that our behavior needs to match our beliefs. And so, Father, we come before you this morning and we seek your forgiveness for those times when our behavior did not match our beliefs. When that living faith wasn't as living as it needs to be. Father, each one of us, we know that there are those times in our lives, whether it was by thought or word or by action or lack of action. God, we seek your forgiveness. And we claim the promise in your word once again that you are faithful and you are just. And when we confess our sins, you will forgive us of our sins and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you promise to continue leading us and guiding us by your Spirit, into the way in which you would have us to go. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for that ongoing forgiveness in the name and for the sake of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, as we enter into this new week which you have set before us with opportunities that you will give us, Lord, that you will bless us with the courage to be the people you want us to be, to do what you would have us to do, to say what you would have us to say, to think what you would have us to think. And that for your name's honor and glory, so that those around us might see uh, our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Father, we thank you for a very special birthday upcoming for Alice and Beston. 105 years of life, for many of us that is hard to even imagine. 
Lord, we're so thankful for the faithfulness you've displayed in Alice's life. Thankful for the sharpness of her mind. And we know her body is frail. But God, you continue to be with her day by day. We give you thanks and praise. We pray that it be a special day for her on Thursday. We thank you for your special care in all of our lives. And we thank you for your constant provision and your presence among us and with us every moment of every day for the fact that we are truly never alone. We give you thanks for that. Father, we want to pray in a very special way today for those who are dealing with the devastation brought by both fire and water around our country. Fires up and down the west coast and the flooding caused by Hurricane Sally in the Gulf states. Father, we know that there's been much, uh, much devastation, much loss, much loss of property and some loss of lives as well. Father, we pray for those people in those situations and what they're dealing with. And we ask that you would show us ways that we can respond in a very tangible way. We thank you even for our own denomination and how it's already responded. And Father, help us to uh, come alongside of that too. And Father, we pray for other concerns that are plaguing our nation. Uh, we certainly pray for the ongoing health concerns with COVID-19. Certainly with the, the political climate and the looming election and the concerns expressed about racial equality and so many other things going on around us that we see and watch and hear about on the news from day to day. And Father, no, mer no matter where we fall in our concern of these things, help us to be aware, help us to pray, help us to be able to ask for your will to continue to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, for our leaders uh, in our nation, for the leaders uh, that you put in positions of authority around the world, and the decisions that they make from day to day, Father, may they truly seek you. We pray, too, for our council, uh, leading in such a, a unique time. Uh, we pray for ongoing unity, for community understanding, for a sense of joy, uh, not just uh, in the leadership, but in the body as well here at Graf's Cup Church. Father, help us to be continually thankful for the many blessings you have showered down upon us. And for those with special needs today, we pray, uh, those among us here, uh, for those who are battling diseases or receiving treatments, and for those mourning the loss of loved ones as well. And Father, we pray for your, your hand to be upon each one in a special way. And for others who are recovering from surgeries, recuperating, we pray for your, your health and strength to visit them. We pray for our kids and our young people at school and the challenges that they face there. Uh, continue to encourage them. Be with Hannah Ritzma in a special way as she has begun basic training in San Antonio, Texas uh, for the Air Force. And we ask, Lord, that you would guard, keep, and protect her and and give her what she stands in need of as well. Father, there's so many things to bring before you. So many things that can have a tendency to, uh, to sit on our shoulders and to weigh us down. But just to know that you invite us to bring all those concerns and those things that would cause us anxiety to you. And to lay them at your feet. And to know that not only are you loving enough to have us do that. But you are strong enough to deal with whatever it is that we bring. That this is what makes you our almighty Father. We're so thankful for that. Lord, bless us as we continue in our service today. As we, as we look into your word, as we receive instruction and a challenge therein. And be reminded uh, very particularly of how it is you, you want us to live as your people. As we live these lives of love that you're calling us to. Uh, Father, that we would learn well and that we would put into action what we what we learned today. Lord, for, again, for all of these things, we give you thanks, we give you praise, we humble ourselves before you. And God, we, uh, we pray that through all that is done here and, and in the lives that you've given to us, that you and you alone would receive the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, as we prepare to uh, listen to God's word this morning, we're going to sing together. Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Let's stand as we sing. Well, congregation, this morning we are continuing uh, in a series, a study that we began just last Sunday morning. Uh, This is a a study that, uh, as one person uh, compared it to, it's like a trek uh, up what one person has called the Mount Everest of love writings, and that, of course, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, I'm not going to read that entire chapter for us this morning as I just did it last Sunday, and I, I will read it from time to time in the course of this series. Uh, so I want to keep it in front of us, certainly, but I want us to listen very closely once again to, uh, to really the central aspect of that chapter, right? The heart of that chapter, 
uh, which is verses 4 through 8, right? Paul's description of this love that we're talking about, the love that, that Paul says at the very end of chapter 13 is, in fact, the greatest of these, right? Now, these three remain, he says, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So that this is what Paul writes uh, here in verses 4 through 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as led by the Holy Spirit. He says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. As I mentioned last Sunday, these words really get to the heart of what love really is, right? Of what it really means to love other people. And we're not talking here uh, in this series, even as Paul was not certainly talking about, we're not talking about love in the abstract, right? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about love in the real world. Uh, we're talking about love in the trenches, so to speak, right? Exactly the kind of love uh, that Jesus was talking about when he told us that we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, at the same time, we do need to remember and never forget as we make our way through these various characteristics of love that in calling us to love in this way, God is not asking us to somehow manufacture something out of nothing, right? That's not what's going on here. But in fact, he's inviting us to draw out of the, the infinite reservoir of God's love, and that's a love that, that by his grace he has poured into our lives, right? Now, even as 1 John uh, 4 verse 19 reminds us, John says there, we love because God first loved us. We love because he first loved us. In other words, we can love in this way. We have the capacity to love in this way because that's the love that God has poured into us. So we need to keep that always in the front of us. Now that said, last week we, we considered uh, the premier expression of love, right? The very first word that Paul lists here in his description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And that word, of course, is patient, right? Paul told us love is patient. It's macrothumia, right? That was the Greek word we all learned last week. In other words, it's long-tempered, right? Or in the opposite way, as Paul goes on to describe it in verse 5, he says, love is not easily angered, right? It takes a long time to boil, right? It keeps that flame down. By the way, how do we all do in practicing that patience? this week. Should I ask for a show of hands on that, or do you want to keep our hands down, right? Because I know we all had opportunities to engage with this, right? We all had opportunities to practice this patience, right? It's not about just waiting in a waiting room or something like that. It's about being long-tempered, keeping that flame low, right? Not easily angered. I, I won't show uh, I won't ask for a show of hands, but uh, continue to think about that, right? Not only through the past week, but as we go. We're, we're building on things, right, from week to week. So this morning, we want to take a look at the second word that Paul lists here in describing love. That, of course, is the word kind. As Paul puts it in verse 4, love is kind. So what is kindness? I think for many of us, uh, if someone just approached us out of the blue on the street and asked us for a definition of what it means to be kind or what kindness is, I would imagine that most of us would probably say something along the lines of, well, it means being nice to other people, right? I think that's uh, probably the first thing that would come to our minds, right, if someone just asked us out of the blue. What, what kindness is? Well, it's being, it's being nice, to someone else. And really, I have to admit, to a great extent, that's a pretty good definition, right? That's, that's actually pretty accurate. In fact, the word that Paul uses here that is translated in our English text as kind, it literally means to provide something 
beneficial for someone, right? So to be nice to someone, right? To provide something beneficial for someone. But then it goes on to add this. It is to bless someone. And it really is that concept of blessing that I want us to focus our attention on with respect to connecting it to kindness here. Because you see, the root of kindness, if we look at the word in the original language, the root of kindness, both linguistically but also practically, the root of kindness is grace. Both of those words flow from the same, right? It's grace. And I think we all know what grace is about, right? Grace is giving to someone something that they have not earned and do not deserve. And that really is what kindness is all about. It's about blessing someone in some way. Not because they've earned it, not because they deserve it, but just because, right? Just to bless them. And in blessing them, follow this now, in blessing them, we honor them. You see that? In blessing them, we honor them. That's what kindness does. It honors people as worthwhile, as significant, as important. If we want to give that in Christian language, kindness affirms people as image bearers of God, fellow image bearers of God, no matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they're a believer or not. All right, so that's what this is all about. Kindness and blessing go hand in hand. In other words, you cannot simply be kind conceptually. You cannot be kind conceptually. You cannot just be kind in theory. Because kindness is only kindness when it blesses someone. When it provides something beneficial for them. And and that's exactly why in Scripture, as we read Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God is referred to as kind, or sometimes the word compassionate is used there. Those are almost interchangeable words. But that's why God is referred to over and over again as kind, because of the blessings He has given to us. And of course, the chief blessing of all is salvation. Right, Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. Listen for the connection between grace and kindness. He says, And God raised us up with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Or Paul puts it this way in Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. He says, But when the kindness and love of our Savior appeared, he saved us, Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And so the point is here, and I want to make this very clear, that that if God's kindness had only been a thought in his mind, if God's kindness had even just been an impulse in his heart, you and I would still be in trouble. You and I would still be lost in our sins. We would still be destined for death and ultimately destined for that eternity without God. If God's kindness was only here or even here. But it wasn't because God's kindness took action. And very specifically, it put on flesh and blood and it reached out to us and it saved us when we could not save ourselves. You see that? Kindness is only kindness when it blesses someone. Now, as true as that is with respect to our relationship with God, it is equally as true with respect to our relationship to others and this call on our lives as God's people to love others. So think of it this way. If patience is the premier expression of love, then kindness is the premier demonstration of love. And what better way? What better way would it be for people to to understand God's love than to experience that love? And what better way for them to experience that love than to be kind? Because after all, the world around us, for all of its beauty, and make no mistake about it, it it is a beautiful 
world. But for all of its beauty, the world around us is rather harsh, isn't it? As one person put it, kindness isn't normal. Kindness isn't normal. You know, the opposite of kindness is not what we would think. The opposite of kindness is not meanness. In fact, the opposite of kindness is rudeness. It is shameful or even disgraceful behavior towards someone else. It is treating others with contempt. And I think that's exactly why Paul goes on in verse 5 to reinforce what he said here in verse 4. Love is kind. He goes on to say, love is not rude. Love isn't rude. The rude person has no respect for other people. She really doesn't care about the concerns of others. In fact, the rude person doesn't really care about anyone else. And he certainly doesn't want to seek to bless anyone. And isn't rudeness the prevailing posture of our world today? Isn't it? Isn't that the norm? And it's that rudeness, it's exactly that rudeness which makes this world so harsh and so abrasive. But in the face of that, love is kind. Love seeks to reach out and, and bless those people whom God puts in our path every single day, no matter who they are. You know, as I was researching a little bit more of this topic and floating around the internet a little bit, I came across a website called uh, Random Acts of Kindness. And I wasn't very familiar with it, so I surfed around a little bit, and and I was introduced to a variety of people, the vast majority of whom come from a Christian perspective. But these people have made kindness the number one motivating principle of their lives. So I ran into someone uh, by the name of John Sweeney. He started a movement called Suspended Coffees that just focuses on the simple act of buying coffee for other people. Then there's Madison Steiner. She started a program called Peaches Neat Feet. Basically gives uh, personally painted shoes to to kids that are dealing with life-threatening diseases. Then there's uh, Peggy Filler. She uh, created a, a kindness club that just does random acts of kindness for students in a high school near Seattle. And then even little eight-year-old Abby, she collects clothes for the homeless. The stories went on and on. I'd invite you to take a look at that website later on today. But then I happened upon Kelsey's story. And Kelsey's story really stood out to me. It really caught my attention. I want to share it with you. These are her words. One afternoon, my friends and I were painting a banner for our high school homecoming in the hallway, but kept having to go inside the girls' bathroom to wash off our messy brushes. I noticed a girl standing in the bathroom quietly sobbing to herself. Everyone kept passing this girl, pretending that she wasn't even there. I myself had spent several years of high school standing in bathrooms around the school crying because I was struggling with depression and anxiety. It triggered something deep within my heart. As I saw some of myself in this girl. So despite being a bit shy, walking up to a stranger, I approached the girl and asked if she was okay, even though I knew she wasn't. She shook her head no, and I told her that she wasn't alone, and I would do anything she needed me to to ease this pain she was in. The school day was almost over, and she had to catch her ride, so I gave her my phone number and made her promise to text me that night so we could talk and She wouldn't have to cope alone. We ended up texting most of the night. And the next morning she told me that had I not stopped and given her my time, 
she probably would have gone through with her plan and committed suicide. Kelsey goes on to say, I had no idea as we were standing in the bathroom that she was about ready to take her life and that an act that seemed so small to me made all the difference in her life. Makes all those sayings about the power of kindness suddenly seem so true. Kindness. Seeking to bless people, to honor them, to affirm them as fellow image bearers of God, to provide something beneficial for them. It could be a cup of coffee or a, or a coat. It could be a pair of painted shoes. It could be our time. It could just simply be noticing them. But whatever it is, kindness is the premier demonstration of love. And the fact of the matter is one small act of kindness can go a long way. One person put it this way. He said, you can't measure the impact of a kind act because its reach is far greater than we can imagine. And it's more impactful than we ever dare to dream. Along those lines, I'm going to step away for just a moment. The screen's going to go blank, and we're going to get a video queued up. And I'm going to show you this short video. It's called The Butterfly Effect of Chris Bozzati. I'm here today because I'm going to die. Soon, I've tried to make the lives of those around me better. And that's how I'm going to live the rest of my life, whatever time I have left. My name is Chris Rosati. I am a father to two amazing girls, a husband to a beautiful and supportive wife, and a friend to more great, quality people than I can count. Despite all that's changed, what I cannot do will not change who I am. He came home one day and said, I really want to take a Krispy Kreme drone that truck and just throwing donuts out the window. He posted on Facebook and that's when Krispy Kreme latched on. You got 12 chances in that box to make somebody really happy, you know, with a random act of kindness. It was a way for, for him and for us to feel happy and to feel joy, knowing that there's something here to doing a very simple act of kindness that can turn into something huge and make hundreds, thousands of people happy. So it, it quickly developed Inspire Media. We want to encourage people to do good in creative ways and then to spread the word about it via these short five-minute films. At the premiere, we really we rented out the Carolina Theater that seats 900 people. And we were thinking, well, maybe there'll be enough to fill up like part of the downstairs, and it was packed. He wants everybody that he touches to learn the things that he has learned through his life and his suffering now without having to experience that. He wants to work with kids because they don't know not to think it's possible. We were sitting in Elmo's diner. Chris Rosati was sitting at a table kind of next to us. As we're getting ready to leave, he said, I want you to go over to that table where those girls are having dinner and just tell them really quickly who I am. I think I wrote on a piece of paper, you know, you can Google my husband, here's his name. Um, and he said, give them this $100 and have them impact somebody's Christmas. Just wow. I felt like 
we have to figure out something really great to do with this money. We, we thought, thought maybe, about Africa because of our dad's nonprofit organization, Africa, yes. We were going to throw a feast, like a Thanksgiving feast. People made signs that said, thank you for spreading kindness, Chris Rosati. We were reading it and I, I mean, just blown away by what they, they did. He's dying and he wants to spread as much kindness in the world as he can. I really appreciate his complete faith in the goodness of everybody. I wanted to know if anybody's positively impacted your life. Yes. All right. Well, so today you would have a unique way to go into our thank you booth and record a free private video for you to send to that person to say thank you. You can go in there and we're going to take a video of you. I would like to say thank you for Claire for being my best, 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 best friend ever. You spent the last 28 years of your life being a great father to me and Marvin. This is Mom. I just wanted to tell you that I really appreciate you. If I were to thank my dad, I would thank him for being awesome, wonderful, and creative. And I'm proud of him. I don't want people to feel bad for us. You know, I think we're having a lot of fun, and we're seeing something beautiful about each day that I don't know that we would have been able to see without being faced with a, such a challenge. The butterfly effect is the theory that one seemingly small action can ultimately lead to a large change. Kindness can spread exponentially. One act could lead to countless others. And each of those acts could each lead to countless more. One, just one, one small act of kindness, a box of donuts, a $100 bill, one small act of kindness can go a long way, right? You can't measure the impact of a kind act because its reach is far greater than we can imagine and it's more impactful than we ever dare to dream. Here's a question for each and every one of us to honestly consider. What is your kindness quotient? We can think of it this way. If we put a, a scale up there from 1 to 10, 10 being the, the, the most kind a person you, you could ever be, and 1 being that rudeness factor, where do you place yourself on that spectrum what is your kindness quotient? Or as Max Lucado describes it, when was the last time you did something kind for someone in your family? Got a blanket, cleaned off the coffee table, prepared the coffee without being asked. Think about your school or workplace. Which person is the most overlooked or avoided? A shy student? grumpy employee, maybe he doesn't speak the language, maybe she doesn't fit in. Are you kind to this person? Kind hearts, he goes on to say, are quietly kind. They let the car cut into traffic and the young man, uh, excuse me, the young mom with three kids move in the checkout line, move up in the checkout line. They pick up the neighbor's trash can that rolled into the street and they are especially kind at church. They understand that perhaps the neediest person they'll meet all week is the one standing in the foyer or sitting in the row behind them in worship. And what about your enemies? How kind are you to those who want what you have or take what you have? What is your kindness quotient? I would just simply invite all of us to very carefully consider, to really think about the kindness that God has shown to you in Jesus. 
giving to you Jesus as your Savior, the one who could save you from your sins, not because of what you've done or not because you've earned it in any way whatsoever, but just simply to bless you. And in that context, consider the kindness that we're called to extend to others, no matter who they are, and make a decision to do it. Perhaps it's someone you know, perhaps it's just a a random act. But remember, you cannot just be kind conceptually. It doesn't work that way. Kindness is only kindness when it blesses someone. And kindness shown in Jesus' name is the premier demonstration of Christian love. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray and we ask that you would help us, each one of us, to be more kind. Not just to make this world a a little less harsh and abrasive, but to be conduits of the kindness you've shown to us, the blessings you've given to us, and to shine a light on Jesus himself. Give us opportunities this week. Lead us by your Spirit. And when those opportunities come, may we have the courage to do what you're inviting us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in a moment, we're going to close our service here by singing a song called Lord Whose Love in Humble Service. Uh, But right before we do that, God wants to give us his blessing uh, as we go from this place. Would you please stand to receive that blessing? And just a reminder as well, as you exit, there's an opportunity uh, to give today, uh, very appropriately, I think, given our topic. Uh, The offering is for uh, Thanksgiving holiday baskets for Bravo. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, As you exit, you'll find those baskets directly to your right uh, as you go through the main doors there. Before we sing together, God's going to give us his parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen.